when it seems like all is lost, when it feels as if you have no hope, when you are outnumbered, overpowered, and they've got you cornered, that's when you realize your last best hope is you. Halo, Combat Evolved, rated M for Mature. As far as Western franchises go in the video game industry, I can't think of a stronger example of a meteoric rise to popularity than Halo. Up until writing this script, Halo has released five mainline entries, a prequel game, a spin-off in the form of Halo 3 ODST, a mobile game no one talks about, two dips in the pool of real-time strategy, and a bunch of movies and books on top of that. Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2 of both sense also received an anniversary edition with in-game visuals, cutscenes, and audio all being remade and remastered. The graphics for both in-game and cutscenes in the anniversary edition of Combat Evolved are great, but for the sake of aesthetic, all the footage I captured for this video was taken with the original graphics, though I left the remastered soundtrack and audio because why not? Conceptually, ideas started floating around which would eventually coalesce into being Halo Combat Evolved in the late 90s and was originally being tooled to be a real-time strategy game utilizing third-person perspective. Financial difficulties related to prior releases forced Bungie into a tough spot and they had to pull something together fast. After some corporate chess and stuff moving around, Microsoft bought Bungie and officially announced it to the world in 2000. These were not quite happy circumstances as Bungie was now heavily relied on to release something that would be a launch title for the upcoming Microsoft console, the Xbox. And they had to make the product in just about a year. The Russian time window led to a lot of features and ideas being scrapped, like their intended open world design, inclusion of online multiplayer, and so forth. Launching on the original Xbox in November of the Year of Our Lord 2001, Bungie released Halo Combat Evolved, directed by the mythological unicorn known as Jason Jones. And you're put inside the helmet of Master Chief Spartan 117 with human AI Cortana talking in your ear throughout to provide intel and direction, with her own bit of sassy attitude and personality to counter Chief's stoic and mostly quiet and cool demeanor. Master Chief also ranks at the top of the list of strongest anime entities alongside Jesus and Goku. Halo has a lot going for it. Its soundtrack devised by Martin O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore has such a diverse range. To punchy percussive beats, to booming orchestra, to sick techno light beats in the most iconic bar of all time. The soundtrack has stuck with me ever since the first time I played the game, and I played this game so, so much. It's one thing to have great cutscenes and a plot and so forth, but it takes more than that to keep an audience. It needs to have good gameplay. Oh right, the gameplay is fucking excellent. It's so... Ah... It's an FPS through and through in a time way, way before games adopted the strategy of putting tons of mechanics like skill trees and crafting and survival and hunger meters and wearing a certain sort of shoes on Tuesdays and side quests and character customization. Oh, the combat just flowed well. They spent a lot of time with the controls of the game since first person shooters on consoles weren't really much of a thing in that time. That genre was mainly relegated to the mouse and keyboard controls on PC. The innovation of a regenerating energy shield on top of your traditional health bar made it possible to spend more time running and gunning, and less time hiding and crying. The variety of weapons to use helped keep things interesting somewhat, and the restriction of only holding two weapons at a time made you want or need to scavenge the battlefield and even during firefights for ammo for a more fitting weapon. It's not much, but it's still worth mentioning that many times throughout the campaign you'll be reinforced by marine NPCs and they do... mostly a good job. 
Though on higher difficulties, you might as well have a squad of tissue sheets armed with UNSC assault rifles. Seriously, on higher difficulties, these guys straight up just evaporate. Just, they're just gone. They, they help. They, they're, they're trying their best. Let's talk a quick minute about what you actually fight in Halo, the Covenant. You have four species that make up the Covenant in Combat Evolved. Grunts, Jackals, Elites, and Hunters, conveniently color-coded by rank. Grunts are the lowest on the ladder. They'll mostly use light arms aside from the occasional fuel rod cannon, and rank from low yellow to red to silver. Grunts are the only species of Covenant in Combat Evolved that speak human language, a feature which is used for a bit of comic relief throughout the game. Some sections of the game have sleeping grunts where you can simply just whack them to put them down, but any gunfire or alert will wake them up. The AI of this game that came out in 2001 really shines here where the grunts and jackals will break rank and panic. Jackals are the shieldy boys, sporting really sweet wrist-mounted energy shields. These shields will deflect a lot of projectiles and grenades so from there you have to measure your shots and aim for their hands or feet or flank them or rely on good old splash damage. There are only two ranks of Jackal in this game with low blue and orange. The commanders of the battlefield are the elites and the elites are the enemies that really made me start to truly love Halo back in the day. They felt smart. They bark orders and duck and dive in response to your movements. They also have regenerating energy shields, and they will take cover when their shields drop to allow them to recharge. A dropped shield or other circumstances will cause them to enrage and they will outright charge you. In pretty much every context, a melee to their back is a one-hit kill, especially handy on higher difficulty settings. Elite flavors come in blueberry, raspberry, coconut, and the rare pineapple. Pineapple elites are the only rank seen in combat evolved that wield energy swords. When the situation calls for it, silver and gold elites will also come decked out with invisibility modules. It's hard to hate them when they have such buttery smooth vocal cords. Allow me to play you the song of my people. Side note here, elites will laugh at you when you die and it makes me crack up pretty much every single time it happens. Prototype footage for the game shown elites having their own wrist-mounted energy shields. Whether that was cut from the game due to time constraints or balancing, I don't know. The combat sandbox in Halo Comp Evolved has a certain simplicity to it which mostly works in its favor. One of the real selling points here is that the Covenant feel and act intelligent. There are five human weapons that are usable being the assault rifle, magnum, shotgun, sniper rifle, and rocket launcher, and they all act as you imagine they would. The Covenant on the other hand have three weapons you can use being the plasma pistol and rifle and the needler. Now I need to find my fucking place. <clears throat> Plasma pistol and rifle run on batteries instead of magazines for some reason. For a supposedly superior military force with advanced alien technology, you'd think they have a more cost-effective weapon instead of letting off their shots and just dropping the guns in the trash bin after. The plasma rifle is simply a covenant alternative to the assault rifle. While the plasma pistol can be charged up to shoot a stronger homing blast, which fully depletes elite energy shields and jackal wrist shield. The needler does use magazines and acts unique in that it shoots homing needles that explode when enough embed into an enemy. The needler is very satisfying to use, seeing those needles cascade into the target and hearing the enemy scream knowing they're about to die. Another note worth mentioning here is that explosions will set off a domino effect of grenades and such that are on the ground, which can be used to your advantage if you have the spatial awareness to use that information, but most of the time you'll just die. The main problem with the combat is that mostly you can blow through every room in the game using just a few specific weapons. The Magnum is so stupidly overpowered that you feel almost pressured to use it whenever you come across one, and the addition of a scope for some reason just makes it that much more capable. There is no scope at all on the model of this gun. Where is it? The assault rifle is also good to have, especially when you start dealing with the flood in the last half of the game, to spray and take out the popcorn and to dispatch grunts and jackals. Speaking of flood, from there on out, you might as well just super glue a fucking shotgun to your hands, especially in higher difficulties, because the range of the shotgun is stupid good, for one thing. 
and the large flood will rush and leap towards you so the best answer every time is just center your crosshair and press right trigger or the left mouse button on your fucking mouse they're Ugh. The shotgun is the best hard counter against flood in general and pretty much everything else and that could have been balanced out by just throttling the amount of ammo provided but so many flood that wield weapons will have shotguns so you're never running low on shells. You only have two usable human vehicles, the warthog and the tank, while on the covenant side you can use ghosts and banshees. Prototype footage shows what would later be known as the Gauss Warthog, which we wouldn't see until Halo 2, and the Revenant, which we wouldn't see until Halo 3. The Chain Gun Warthog in Combat Evolved has no overheat meter of any sort, so you can just hold fire all day for a big win. It packs enough of a punch to be useful even on higher difficulties, especially since it has unlimited ammo. The Ghost is a fun toy to play with, and while its mounted plasma guns don't pack as much of a punch, it's a fun single player vehicle to speed around in. Ramming enemies in the Ghost sometimes just doesn't work because you'll find yourself easily gliding over smaller enemies instead of ever hitting them. The Banshee is the only usable aerial vehicle in Combat Evolved and is fun to use as well. It has dual mounted plasma cannons as well as a fuel rod cannon. My favorite part about the Banshee is that now trademark screeching sound it makes when you fly at higher speed. The tank operates how you'd expect with a mounted chain gun and rocket, both controlled by the driver and also has seats on its treads for up to four marines or co-op buddies to sit. The sound design in general in Combat Evolved was really well done. All the guns really felt like they packed a punch. They felt aggressive. The human weaponry sounded real and the Covenant weaponry sounded believable as well. You have audio cues to tell you when your shield is low and when it's recharging. All of the Covenant have their own distinctive sounds and noise, so when you can't see them, you can still easily discern whether there's a few jackals around the corner or a pair of hunters. The gurgles and guttural noises and screams of the flood you'll encounter in the back half always remind you that they lurk close by. Anyways, I've spent so much time talking about the video game, let's talk about the video game. The campaign of Halo Combat Evolved spans 10 missions. Upon loading up the game, you... God damn. This menu brings so many emotions and nostalgia. The cool blue hue of the simple menu, the rings spinning and floating and doing space stuff with this iconic main theme playing. The main theme has equal parts mystery and sorrow, its booming chanting imply the big empty of space. Finally the track starts to pump into a more percussive and epic line. The strings start to belt out with this fight to save the universe feeling. It just gets you pumped and gives you the feeling of action. A lot is told and conveyed just in the main theme, in its main menu. Mission numero A, Pillar of Autumn. Pillar of Autumn opens up with a cold open and you are met with Captain Hello My Name Keys conversing with Cortana. They have recently escaped to pursuit by Covenant forces, but they are out of the woods. The Covenant prove themselves to be crafty and are still hot on their tail. The situation comes directly off of events that go down in the prequel book Fall of Reach, which released less than a month before the game did, so if you didn't read the book before this point, well, you're out of luck, and no one has time to explain what's going on. Hello, my name Keys puts the command through to put the entire station on high alert and man their battle stations. During this cutscene, you're also briefly introduced to Sergeant Johnson before finally viewing a few jobbers get the order to wake up the big man himself, Master Chief, and they're all like, what? No way, that's crazy, that's, like, he's not ready. You're hardly able to wake up and make your bed before it really hits the fan and you have to make your way to the bridge to meet with Hello My Name Keys with no weapon in hand. Upon meeting with the captain, it is determined that the only option is to jump ship. Hello My Name Keys will land the Autumn on the ring himself and commands Master Chief to take possession of Cortana and evacuate. The rest of the mission is a push through the station to get to an escape pod, punching through the Covenant boarding parties. They did a good job here of conveying that the Pillar of Autumn is being battered by Covenant with explosions going off and the ship occasionally sh shaking. In stark contrast to the previous level, which had you battling in claustrophobic hallways and rooms, you're brought into the wide open nature of Halo, the ring itself. 
You're the only one who made it alive from your drop pod and have to make a run for it to avoid incoming Covenant search parties. You see waterfalls and trees and grass, a landscape that seems familiar before being met with strange alien-made angular structures. The world feels believable while you can still be reminded of the fact you're on an alien world by simply looking up at one of the many beautiful skyboxes Bungie crafted for the game. You rendezvous with a group of marines and non-combat humans and defend them from incoming covenant until eventually Fohammer Echo 419 comes to pick them up to bring them to safety, as well as dropping off for you a warthog, and this is your first taste of the sweet vehicle combat you're gonna get to have fun with throughout the game. After providing reinforcement to the other surviving marines spread throughout the rocky outcrops and alien structures, find out marines along with Hello My Name Keys were taken prisoner aboard Covenant Battlecruiser Truth and Reconciliation, which is coincidentally the name of the next mission. Truth and Reconciliation kicks off in the dark with you and a squad of marines decked out in sniper rifles sporting night vision scopes. The first half of the mission is a cool pseudo stealth segment, seeing you push through Covenant camps to get to the the ship itself and board it via its grav lift. And it is here you first encounter the hunter. Upon boarding the vessel, you quickly discover that elites have access to invisibility and cool energy swords that you're not allowed to use yet because that was scrapped. Wait until the sequel. Now you're tasked with combing another ship full of claustrophobic hallways to keep the pacing fresh from the last mission and a half of wide open spaces. Eventually you will find Hello My Name Keys and a small group of surviving marines in the brig. During this cutscene, Cortana discovers that the Covenant worship the ring that they all currently are hovering over, and that it is some form of super weapon, one that they seek to take control of. That's bad news. Hello My Name Keys dispatches Chief and Cortana to find and secure the control room, first by finding where the darn thing is, which leads you to Silent Cartographer. Back out in the open air, the mission kicks off once again by being dropped in with a squad of marines by Echo 419. The theme music is bumping, and you assault the beach of this island, quickly dropping all Covenant in your LZ. Upon clearing it, Echo 419 drops off a Warhog for you and you're off. The map room itself is locked up and you gotta have to go the long way around to unlock it manually, I guess. Once you go back to the main structure housing the map room, you descend down to the lowest point to secure it. On your way down, Radio Chatter reveals that you're pressed for time as Covenant are incoming and really don't like that you're poking around their house. Cortana makes quick work of reading the map. Now all that's left here is to get out and things get lit. The familiar theme you've already heard up to this point now has a badass guitar solo and riffage going on over it as you scrap through the Covenant parties which have made their way into the building to ask you to leave very politely. Hello. <laughs> What? My wife! Uh, I saw you. Just leave that in there. <laughs> My wife! Wife! You're picked up by Echo 419 and brought down underground into the next mission, Assault on the Control Room. After a couple corridors and rooms, you come outside again to a bridge and it's snowing for some reason. Even Cortana sounds perplexed by this. Another banger track starts on a pale horse as Sergeant Johnson radios in that he needs backup. When you make it down to the ground level, you get your first taste of the ghost, which I love, but just as soon as you get comfy in the driver's seat, you come across a whole ass tank, ready for you to drive. From there, it's a hard push through the territory before finding the structure which houses the control room. This part's kinda cool because with a bit of finesse, you can steal a banshee out from under the Covenant at a certain point and straight up just fly to the door and into the control room. The control room is a really cool looking place and it has a sweet hologram of the ring spinning and floating around. The prophecy is true. You plug Cortana into the terminal and she gets super hyped about all the information at her fingertips but quickly becomes alarmed as Hello My Name Keys is on the verge of waking up something that definitely shouldn't be awakened. 
Now we are at my favorite mission in the whole game. The first cutscene shows jackals and grunts fleeing something through. Okay. <laughs> All right. The first cutscene shows jackals and grunts fleeing something through a foggy and strange jungle as you get dropped off by Echo 419. This weird and unsettling music drones while you cut through the jungle and the Covenant here seem like you are the last thing they are worried about. Getting inside the structure is where the environmental storytelling really shines. Barriers and barricades are set up throughout the, by the Covenant th that you, um, you had, you, you, you they're on edge and things get really messy. Walls are just painted with Covenant blood and bodies laid across. You find a lone marine. Poor guy. Further in, you come into a really cool cut scene taken from the first person view of a marine, which shows you what recently went down around here. Friend of yours? No, we just met. <laughs> Then shit gets a little crazy, really fast. I'll let this part speak for itself. As I said earlier, the entire soundtrack for Combat Evolved is a banger, but this track in particular of Devils of Monsters is criminally underrated. Keys and crew came here expecting to find a weapons cache, but what they really stumbled upon is a containment facility, which you are now tasked with simply just getting the fuck out of. Why are you running? The flood attack in charge with no sense of self-preservation and you quickly find that they also use firearms, also rockets. It was really cool seeing the Covenant fighting for their lives while you make your way and escape. Side note, blood elevator. That's all I really got for this, this line here. I just, I just want you to see the blood elevator. When you finally make it topside, you meet up with a squad of marines and have to run into the jungle towards a close by tower in a clearing for evac. Once you reach the tower, you spot a blue light and some flying robots come down and start attacking the flood. These little guys are sentinels and are annoying. The humming and upbeat orb, monitor 343 Guilty Sparks, has different plans for you and whisks you away. Well. Fuck all those other guys, I guess. Now you are in the library. The only mission in this entire game I can say is outright bad. Honey, you've got a big oh. storm coming. There's a lot of issues I have with this mission, where most of the rest of the game was well paced and had a bit of variety to your room and room encounters. This mission is just keeping its foot on the gas pedal at all times. I get that it's supposed to convey a sense of suffocating and being threatened by the endless waves of flood, but it just doesn't work here. You make your way through pretty much the same few hallways copy pasted over and over. There is no end to the flood that rush you and way too many times you have to just stand there and wait for a room. <sighs> and way too many times you have to stand and wait for a door to be open for you. The whole time you're following Monitor 343 Guilty Spark, and it sounds like he's saying some really important stuff here, but it's really hard to hear any of that while you're constantly firing off your shotgun, which is the only acceptable gun to use throughout this entire mission. Yeah, so what you're gonna need to do, I'll fall. What you're gonna need to do is there's a bomb over there, right? And you really gotta make sure you don't press that button. Definitely not that one. It's really bad. Everything will die. Just oh, by the way, uh, I need to go. Uh, to, uh, I need to unlock the door. Like be Once in a while, you'll have sentinels providing backup, which sorta helps relieve the pressure from you. 
but their support only goes so far. Not a lot even really happens in this mission until the last cutscene where you take possession of the index, which is used to activate the rain. Like it's the key to a car and you just pop it in and turn it. Throughout the whole mission, Master Chief sorta of just doesn't question anything that's happening and blindly follows that humming tin can. I hate this mission, I never liked it, it is bad and dumb and also stupid. Fuck! I hate it! You teleport away back to the control room into another cutscene. Really? Cortana. I've spent the last 12 hours cooped up in here watching you toady about helping that thing get set to slit our throats. Hold on now. He's a friend. Oh, I didn't realize. He's your pal, is he? Your chum? Do you have any idea what that bastard almost made you do? Yes. So the chief almost destroys all sentient life, and the monitor, oh, he was a heal the whole time. The ring doesn't directly kill the flood when activated, it kills all sentient life everywhere, ultimately to starve the flood and prevent them from feeding and spreading. During your escape from the control room, Cortana devises a new plan to destroy the ring, and the bomb is the horse you rode in on, the Pillar of Autumn itself. This is the first of a few maps that were reused in the essence of Bungie saving time during development. This time seeing you travel through most of the mission backwards, and now the snowy landscape is a war zone between the Covenant and the newly awakened Flood. To carry out this plan, you need to find Hello My Name Keys to reclaim his neural implants that he has so you can turn on the Pillar of Autumn so you can explode it? Anyways, the next mission, simply called Keys, brings you back aboard the Truth and Reconciliation, this time being ravaged by the Flood as well. After a cool drop off the ship into a pool of coolant or whatever that is, a green Gatorade, you comb through the familiar rocky outcrops to get to the grav lift again and re-enter the ship. Find Hello My Name Keys, who is now floodified, and you reclaim his neural implants with very surgical precision. There's not much else to this mission. You take off in a banshee from the hangar and fly your way in big hero fashion into the final mission. <clears throat> okay, fuck me I guess. You're back on the Pillar of Autumn, now mostly abandoned. The Autumn now hosts small fleets of sentinels, squads of high-ranking covenant, and hosts waves on waves of flood seeing all three of them scrapping throughout the level. Your first goal is getting to the bridge, where you find out 343 Guilty Sparks is nearby and foiling your plans to bomb the ring like he's an 80s cartoon bad guy by simply zapping control panels. The ignition of the explosion can be manually triggered and Chief has the perfect plan. You push down to this big room and you have to blow up the insides of four of these fusion, these, these couplings, these, these things. With escalating presence of both sentinels and flood pouring in during this time. This part can get really frustrating if you fall in or approaching the top floor the wrong way since platforming is not the strong suit of this game and it gets annoying. After all four of those things are bombed, the only thing left to do is jump ship. Fohammer Echo 419 is on her way in to grab you, but unfortunately she doesn't make it. You have one last option to escape a lone long sword ship in the hangar. The home stretch is admittedly a really epic moment to experience. The ship is blowing up and buckling throughout your escape. Enemies of all factions are skirmishing and trying to escape as well. The main theme booms out one final time. Now that's a lot of damage! Shut them down, we'll need them later. Happy feet! Wombo combo! That ain't Falco! That ain't Falco! And that just about gives you the bullet points of the campaign. I won't sit here and say the plot is groundbreaking and innovative. It is relatively simple and straightforward and gets the job done, I guess. A minor gripe I have about the plot is Master Chief himself. 
I love Master Chief. He's a badass. His voice is super memorable and strong. He is a man of few words. What annoys me is instances like the library and two betrayals. He doesn't question the monitor. He doesn't ask what the index is, it, uh, what it does. It's very clear that 343 Guilty Spark knows everything there is to know <gasps> about the ring, but he doesn't capitalize on this opportunity to get information on what they're doing and where they are. In the library, he gets teleported to this random structure by some random robot and sort of just goes with it. He doesn't even stop to be like, hey, wait a minute, uh, what? And in the beginning of Two Betrayals, it's very Saturday morning cartoon where Cortana's like, oh, he's cool, huh? He almost made you destroy all life everywhere. Hmm, interesting. He's such a cool guy. He totally didn't tell you that part, though, huh? It's maybe because I didn't ask any questions. And in that one particular instance, Chief almost feels like a bit of a fucking moron. It's established back in Mission 3, Truth and Reconciliation, that the ring is a super weapon of some sort, one that your main antagonist of mysterious aliens worship like a religious symbol and also want to gain control of. When it's already known that the giant ring you stand on floating in space is a super weapon and you get the key to activate it, which the Flood are also trying their damn hardest to get before you, you aren't gonna stop even for a second to wonder how exactly that would work and how that would play out. Master Chief spends more time doing instead of talking and thinking and does not hesitate to act. That mindset is an issue here in the context of Halo Combat Evolved. You have no idea what you're dealing with and what the potential repercussions of your actions are. Issue number two, as much as I love them, is the Flood. How exactly were they awakened? Was it Keys and the DK crew poking around in this one specific structure? Was that whole building a casket that housed the sleeping threat? Or was it the Covenant who were already there? I've played through this game countless times over the last 20 years of my fucking life and there's still questions like that that still don't seem like anything more than plot holes and conveniences. Playing off that, how intelligent are the Flood? They mostly seem like mindless creatures, but it's shown that they have intelligence at least to gather their meals for later feeding. In Keys, Cortana makes remarks about not allowing the Flood to get off the ring. The Flood rushing and trying to take over the battle cruiser seems to imply that they want to commandeer the ship to fly off the ring. What? The same life form that will mindlessly rush you with lack of self-preservation also can commandeer and fly a giant flying vessel over two kilometers long thank you google one which no doubt takes teams of minds to properly operate what the fuck they really want to take possession of the index too i guess as 343 guilty spark says in the library but do they even know how to use it or does the flood just know that it's an important macguffin that they should really grab before anyone else does playing off that issue is number three hello my name keys being captured and being brought aboard the truth and reconciliation in the beginning of the game makes sense the covenant have already proved to be intelligent and it makes sense that they identified the commanding officer of their enemy and want to take him prisoner what doesn't make sense is how he is suddenly floodified and brought back to Truth and Reconciliation, leading into the penultimate mission of the game. The Flood feed and take hosts within life forms, effectively killing them. Why do they A, not outright eat and take over keys like every other human in Elite they ate up and you've seen up to this point, and B, take him all the way back to this ship. Are the Flood also intelligent enough to know that Keys is a big deal? If so, how? What would even be their end goal to not outright taking over Keys? If the counter argument is the process is gradual and he's in a weird halfway state, it's not illustrated or implied to have ever been the case in any of the life forms up to this point. It's been known forever now that Halo Combat Evolve had to be pulled together in around a year and there were some last minute script changes and so forth to make sure a halfway decent product was put together to meet the deadline. So the only real world explanation I have for these plot holes in wait what's is the rewrites and script changes during the turbulent development period. For this particular instance I will break kayfabe to explain this part and tell you there are answers to all these plot holes and gaps in knowledge in a book that came out almost two years later called Halo the Flood. 
Okay. Oh. The book describes the Flood to have intelligence of their own, and when they start to chew on keys, they realize he has a lot of valuable information. And instead of assimilating him into a combat form, they choose to start forming him into a proto-grave mind, and they want to use his knowledge to help them fly off the ring of truth and reconciliation. Oh. That's all well and fine, I guess, but I never like when you have to learn more of the story from a secondary piece of media on a website or through a book to make the plot make more sense and to give you more information. <clears throat> Halo Combat Evolved became the new contender in the ring for competitive multiplayer with its couch parties and local LAN connected lobbies. Well that wasn't why Tiny Babby Me played Halo 1. It was the story, the levels, and the characters. As flawed as it can be sometimes. It was every day after school with my best friends trying our hardest to master its levels on Legendary and the quotes and references we use to this day. I don't keep it loaded, so you'll have to find ammo as you go. What the hell? Did something just hit us? Move in! Back to the airlock! Halo gave me new tastes for games where previously I had only played Zeldas and Mario's and Donkey Kong 64. It brought equal parts sci-fi and badassery and action and mystery in ways I hadn't experienced in a video game up to that point. As many other people could agree, Halo changed everything. The way I talked about Halo Combat Evolved in this video might lead you to believe that this game was an immediate and massive hit with critics and players, and it wasn't. The game was not an immediate runaway success. First person shooters on a console with control sticks and buttons was a new concept at the time, one that not a lot of people necessarily took to with open arms. Halo Combat Evolved set the groundwork for a franchise and Bungie's fight was just getting started. Closing out the video, I have a short tribute to an old friend and while that fades out, I want to say thanks for watching and listening to me pointlessly ramble about this video game. And you and I, there's a new That's bad news.